edition of Wise Word Ministries. Welcome to our day 17 recap of reading the Psalms in 31 days. Let's get right to it. We are going to read start starting with Psalm 17. It is a Psalm of David and it is the theme of a prayer of a just man. In it, David speaks about how God is just and how he is just. He says, give here a just cause, give heed to my cry, O God. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips, because I am a just man. Let your judgment come forth from your presence, and let your eyes look with equity. Be equitable to me. Treat me fairly, because you have visited me by night. And then in verses 6 through 11, he begins to tell the Lord how I've called upon you for an answer, and I'm asking that you would incline your ear to me, that you would hear what I would have to say. Because I have walked upright before you, O Lord. Keep me as the apple of your eye. And I love this. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. It reminds me of when we read Psalm 91. It says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall what? Abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He says, the wicked have surrounded me as in our steps. And they've set their eyes upon me. And then he ended in verses 13 through 15. Uh, with phrases and with scriptures that tells us this. Our satisfaction, basically, should come from the Lord, not the things of the world, but from the things of God. For he says, arise and comfort me, deliver my soul from the wicked, from men with your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life and whose belly you still fill with treasure. They are satisfied with children. He said, but as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake, because what I have comes from you, not from the world, and I am satisfied with that. Then we move over to Psalm 47, which is of the Psalms of Korah. It is talking about God as being the king of all the earth. It is an enthronement psalm. It is speaking of God sitting on his throne. He is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. And it says, oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to God with a voice of what? Joy. For the Lord most high is to be feared. Everything that we will ever have, God has predestined. How do I know that? Because verse 4 says, he chooses our inheritance for us, the glory of Jacob, whom he loves. And because we have been adopted in and engrafted in, everything that we have has already been predestined, we simply need to walk in the liberty and the freedom that we have been given. And then in verse 5, he says, God has what ascended with a shout, the Lord with the shout of a trumpet. Sing praises to our God, for God is king of all the earth. He is not just my king. He is not just Israel's king. He is the king of all the earth. He reigns over the nation and he sits upon his holy throne, for he is to be highly exalted because he is the king of all the earth and then we turn to psalm 77 and as you may have noticed by now the psalms in the 70s basically are written by asaph and lots of asaph psalms have a little sad tinge to them but he still loves god and he praises god and he really gets upset when he begins to think of these wicked and evil people who seemingly are prospering when the people of God are suffering. And so what he says, my voice rises to you and I cry out to, to out loud to you. Will you hear me, God? In the day of my trouble, I sought you. In the night, my hand was stretched without weariness. My soul refused to be comforted. He was so distressed and so dis disgusted and so distraught, rather, that his very soul, his flesh just could not be comforted. Have you ever seen those people? They're so overwhelmed. They're so emotional that nothing you say or do will comfort them. Well, that's the state he found himself in. He says, I'm so troubled. I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of long ago, when I know that what you have done for my ancestors, you have delivered them. But then he says, God, will you reject us forever? Will you never be favorable to us again? How long do we have to do this? How long will you cease sending your favor in our way? And then I love verse 9 and 10. He said, has God forgotten how to be gracious to us? 
or has his anger withdrawn his compassion? And then he has a Selah moment. In fact, the word Selah is right between verses 9 and 10. It doesn't mean it's something he said. He took a pause and then he came to himself. And verse 10, he says this. Then I said, it is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. It's my grief that was talking, God. He had a Selah moment. He came to him, his senses. He came to himself because he goes on in verse 11 and he says, but I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work because why? Your way is holy. It doesn't matter what it seems like. No, you haven't forgotten me. It was my flesh talking. I was overwhelmed. I was distraught. I was distressed. I was in pain. And so out of my flesh, I began to think that you had forgotten me. But I want you to know that it doesn't matter how you feel. God has not forgotten you. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Have a Selah moment. Pause. And then say to your flesh, hold on. I've come back to myself. I will remember the works of the Lord. I will meditate on what he has done. I will remind myself that it is by his power that I have been redeemed and that I shall be kept. Take yourself a pause, have yourself a Selah moment, and then say to yourself, he is still the king of all the earth. Let's take a look now at Psalm 107. It's a lengthy Psalm and we're not going to certainly go through it all. We don't have that kind of time. But the very first verse is, oh, give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because he is good. And then the verse that we all know, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So the first thing it tells us is what to do. Give thanks to the Lord. Verse two tells us who is to do it. The redeemed of the Lord. So if you've been redeemed of the Lord, you need to say so. And then he starts to go out and tell the Lord how he cried. He says, and I cried to the Lord. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. That's the first time you see it. And then it says, let them give thanks for his loving kindness. And so for Christians, that means we ought to give thanks to the Lord. We ought to recognize that it is his spirit. We ought to be hungry for he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry he's filled with his word. So we should hunger and thirst after the word of God. And then he says again in verse 13, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and broke their bands, but then they went right back to sin again. And then in verse 17, listen to this, who fools because of what their rebellious ways and because of their iniquities were afflicted. God doesn't afflict you because he has nothing better to do. He afflicts you because of your rebellious ways after their disobedience. Then they cried to the Lord again in verse 19. And in verse 20, we see, and he delivered them. So they continued to cry. He continued to deliver, but they never seemed to get the lesson all the way which is why they ended up in Babylonian captivity. It says, but he sets the needy securely on high and he takes him away from his affliction. Who is wise? Let him give heed to the things and consider the mercy and loving kindness of the Lord. And then finally, we look at verse at Psalm 137. It has an inspired writer because we do not know the name of the author. But it talks about the recompense against Babylon. God paying back Babylon for what he allowed them to do. He allowed them to afflict and enslave Israel. And then he pays them back according to how they had treated Israel. Isn't that something? Your disobedience will cause God to allow you to be judged. But then he will come after the very one that judged you. It says the rivers of Babylon, there we sat and wept. When we remember Zion upon the willows of the midst, for there our captors demanded us of songs. Isn't it something you capture me, you torment me, then you say to me, oh, sing me the songs from, sing me what are them church songs you've been singing. Sing me what are them, how they work inside you. And then they say, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? So now it's a corporate phrase. But he says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. It doesn't matter where you are. You could be enslaved. 
you could be captured, you could be in the middle of sin, you could have been a backslider, but even in the midst of all of that, if you can say it's Israel, but I will not forget you, Lord. I have sense enough to know that this is a foreign land. This is not where you preordained and predestined me to be. And I shall not forget you. And I am going to come to my senses and get back to you. Because this I know, you will come after my enemies. He says, remember, O Lord, the sons of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it to its very foundation. Remember Babylon who devastated me. How blessed will be the one who repays you with the recompense with which you have repaid us. How blessed is the one who seizes and dashes your little ones. How blessed is the God of my salvation who will pay my enemy back according to the work that he has done against me. Victory is mine. The battle does not belong to you and it does not belong to me. It belongs to the Lord. Let him fight your battle. God bless you until we meet tomorrow for day 18 recap, and it will be Psalms 18, 48, 78, 108, and 138. God bless you. Welcome to our day 18 recap, reading through the Psalms in 31 days. Thank you so much for joining us. We have now gone beyond the halfway point. This is a time when I'm sure many of us are getting a little weary, but don't give up. You can do it. Let's make it to the finish line. I know my voice sounds like I have three falls in it. It's very early in the morning, not yet 5 a.m., but I've had a very busy weekend and I'm going to have a very busy day, so I need to do this and get it out of the way. Whew, God help me this morning. Let's begin looking at Psalm 18. It is David's victory song. It is what he spoke these words to the Lord when the Lord delivered him from the hand of Saul and all his enemies. And if you don't know that story, you're going to have to go back and read in 1 Kings where David was on the run from King Saul, who all of a sudden got exceedingly jealous of him and sought to kill him. And the Lord delivered David. So Psalm 18 is his victory song. And in it, he says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. And the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. So the Lord was all those things to David because he protected him. And then he tells us in, on whom he called in his distress. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and I cried for help. And then the cause of that was he heard my voice out of his temple. And then the effect of that was the earth shook and the earth quaked and the foundations of the mountains were trembling. So when he called the Lord, the Lord heard him. And when the Lord began to move, things began to happen. The earth shook, the mountains quaked. So when God shows up, even the elements have to back up. And then we look over at verse 16 through uh, 20. And David says these words, he sent from on high. He, he took me, he drew me out of the many waters. And what that says to me is, when the enemy is too much for you to handle, they're never too much for God. Because David said, he delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. So what may be too mighty or too much for you is not nearly enough for God. I promise you, he is omnipotent, all-powerful, strong and mighty. There is none who is mightier, more powerful or stronger than your God. And so in verse 20, he tells us who rewarded him. He said, the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness. Listen to what he said, according to my righteousness. So according to the level of righteousness and faith that is in you is accordingly how you will be rewarded. And then he says, for I have kept the ways of the Lord. This is why he rewarded me, because I was obedient. I walked upright before him. And according to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. He paid me 
according to my obedience, my trustworthiness, and my faithfulness. And then he goes on to tell us that, God, you, you have saved and afflicted people for hearty eyes abase you. So when you have pride and you're full of pride, it is not pleasing to God. For by you I can run upon a troop and by my God I can leap over a wall. Victory comes through the Lord. David recognized that his escape from the hand of Saul and his victory over his enemies was not at his own hand, neither was it by his power, his might, nor by his military prowess, which of course he had much of, but it was simply by the hand and the power of God who was working in him and through him. And then he says, the Lord is a shield to all who take ref refuge in him. God protects and provides for those. And then he goes on to tell us that he pursued his enemies and he overtook them and you have made my enemies turn their back to me. Again, he is recognizing that all of this took place because of the Lord. While it may look to the world that I'm victorious, it is by the hand of God. And then he gives a present tense. He says, he delivers me from my enemies. Surely you lift me above those who rise against me. And now let's take a look at Psalm 48. It is a Psalm of the sons of Korah. And they're giving God praise for the eternal city of God. So verse 1 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain. Now the city of God was Jerusalem. In some instances, you simply may see it called Salem. But they were praising God because in Jerusalem was the temple of God and is where his presence dwelt. God in her palaces. So Jerusalem is and always will be God's chosen habitat. He says, because God will establish her forever in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God. So we look at verse 9. So the, uh, we have fought on your love and kindness in the midst of your temple. And my note in my Bible says, because God is eternal, so shall our praises be unto him. Our praise has to be eternal. There is no beginning. There is no end. It is from everlasting. So let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice. For such is our God. He is our God forever. He will guide us unto death. If you let him, the Lord will be your guiding hand. He will be your protection. He will be the lamp to your feet and the light to your pathway until he calls you home. And now we move to Psalm 78, which is a psalm of Asaph. And again, like many of his psalms. They have a sad note and sad tinge to them, but in the end, he always gives God praise. And so verses 1 through 8, he calls our attention to God. It is Israel's history, and he gives this history from the time they were in Egypt, in slavery, until the time of David. So he says, listen to my instructions and incline your ear. I'll open up my mouth in a parable. I'm going to utter these dark sayings, which we have heard and known. So he's letting them know right off the bat, I'm going to be giving you the history of our people. Because if we don't know where we've been, we can't really know where we're going. And neither can we appreciate how we have gotten to where we are. So he talks about God. He, he's established a testimony in Jacob. That's the person. And appointed a law in Israel. That's the people. So what God did was, established a testimony in the person of Jacob so that he then could appoint a law in the people of Israel. Remember, Jacob later became Israel, but then they became the nation of Israel. And so verses 6 through 8 uh, discusses their sin. And my, my Bible says, when we are in sin, we fail to teach our children about the things of God. So when we don't teach our children about the things of God and where God has brought us and what he has done, we really are in sin because they have no real appreciation for who God is if they have no history of what he has done. And so that is why we have a generation today that is rebellious and stiff-necked. But we need to understand that God changes all things. They're no different than the children of Israel. They, they didn't arise to tell their children that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God. And then when we look at verses 9 through 39, it really is a recount of Israel's history. 
They remember what God has done. And when we do that, it increases our faith as it did their faith. And it causes us to know that we will survive and come through. That no matter what it is we've done and where we are, in the end, we win. And so they go on to talk about how God defeated some of their enemies. And verse 17 says that yet God still con they continued to sin against him. He would deliver them, then they would sin. He would deliver them, then they would sin. But we must never take for granted God's faithfulness to us and his mercy and grace shown to us. Because what we will do is become ungrateful as Israel was. God was and he is still faithful, even though, like Israel, we often are not. And then when we look at verse 34 through 39, he still continues to tell them about their enemy. And so when we look at verses 40 through 45, this is a very long psalm. It's maybe one of the longest you will read outside of 119. He talks about how God created them and caused them to settle in Canaan. He gave them the land of plenty. They settled in Canaan. It is the promised land. Verses 56 through 72 show us God's mercy contrasted with Israel's ingratitude. They were just not grateful for what he had done. Here I am in a land of plenty. Here he has removed people who live there so that they may prosper. And then they decided that they wanted to follow the idols of the very people that God had helped them to defeat. And then verses 56 through 64 show us their disobedience and that the judgment that that disobedience brought them. So now we have the story of the judges and how they built graven images and when God heard it, he was filled with wrath. And so he abandoned his dwelling place at Shiloh and the tent which he had pitched among them. You don't ever want to be where God is not. You don't want him to be so angry that he removes himself from your presence because that will not work out good for you. I can promise you. It leaves you open to the wiles of the enemy and it leads you to a place of judgment and defeat. You don't have to suffer that needlessly. And so then verse 65 through the end, after God's judgment, this is what I love about God. He said, then the Lord awoke as, as if he had been asleep. And like a warrior overcome by wine, he drove our adversaries backward. He put them on an everlasting reproach. He also rejected the tent of Joseph and he did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose Judah. After his judgment, the same people who God allowed to defeat Israel, God now put in the hands of Israel to defeat them. And then they end up with this. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart. Speaking of David, he was a man after God's own heart. And now let's take a look at Psalm 108. It too is a Psalm of David. And he talks about his steadfast love and the steadfast love of the Lord. He says, my heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing, I will sing praises, even with my soul, with the harp and with the lyre. God has spoken in his holiness and I will exalt and portion out Shechem. Who will bring me into this besieged city? Have you not, O God? Will you not go forth before us with our army and then he ends with a prayer through God we will do valiantly and it is he who shall tread down our adversaries David recognized that it would not be Israel or Judah it would be God and only through God would they be able to do valiantly only through the Lord would they have victory and so while we may understand that we have great influence and great knowledge and we may have great affluence and all those things and great education and great power. We need to understand that it is only through God will we do valiantly. And then we end with Psalm 138. It too is a Psalm of David. And he begins with, I will give you thanks, O Lord. I will sing praises to you before the gods, little g. I am going to sing praises about my God, who is the omnipotent God before these little gods who really have no power. I'm going to bow down to your holy temple. And then he says, for your name, you have magnified your word according to your name. Help Jesus. God magnified 
his word according to his name. And on the day that you call, he will answer and he will give you strength and make you bold. And then all the kings, all the enemies of the earth before you must give thanks because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And he ends it with, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies. The Lord will perfect or accomplish what concerns me. For your mercy is everlasting. Do not forsake the works of your hand. And I am the works of your hand. So I want you to be encouraged today to know that the Lord will perfect that which concerns you. So whatever that is, know that he is going to perfect it. God bless you until we meet tomorrow for our day 19 attack where we will read Psalm 19, Psalm 49, 79, 109, and 139. Be blessed.